Um, welcome everyone and thank you for um, coming to my talk on, on Eastern European folklore uh, as part of the Romancing the Gothic lecture series. So I'm Hungarian, I'm actually at the moment in Hungary, and this is not my research expert, research area uh, per se, but um, I have some interest in the supernatural, the Gothic, and I thought I'd put this talk together on a folkloric exploration of, of Eastern European tales, traditions, legends, and with a particular focus on the supernatural. So I um, hope you will enjoy this. <clears throat> um, first of all, before going into my talk, I wanted to show you a map of Eastern Europe, uh, because I don't expect people from um, who, are, who are not from the area to, to know exactly where these countries are from, but that's my has been my experience anyway. Um, so something I wanted to mention before I go into my talk, is that what you see Hungary in the middle. Um, so in 1920, after the World War I, um, uh, Tria, uh, when, when the Trianon Treaty was signed, two thirds of Hungary's territory was also um, taken away. So there has been a lot of uh, shifting borders over the centuries. Um, different ethnic minorities migrated from one place to the other. And therefore, what you will hear me talking about particular countries, folk traditions or folk tales, are kind of um, take it with a grain of salt because these are coming from all across the place and because of the shifting border uh, they existed from one place at a time that is might be a different place now. <clears throat> um, the first section is going to explore legends and historical figures. Um, something I wanted to start with is a question around Huns or Magyars, a kind of Hungarian origin myth. So um, you probably heard of, of the Huns, Attila the Hun as well. Um, and and in, the name, in the English name of, of the country, Hungary, the Hun is also part of, while in Hungarian, it's actually the word Magyar describing Hungarian. And this question around whether Huns or Hungarians um, is explored in Shimon Kese's 13th century chronicles, the deeds of the Huns and Hungarians. So you can see here, there's a differentiation between the two. But um, in this chronicle, uh, the story goes that there was a king called Nimrod, or in some of the translation, he's called Mainrod, who had two um, uh, who had two elder sons, Honor and Magor. And they liked to go and explore um, the, the territories nearby, going into hunting. And one time they came across, uh, during their hunting adventures, a wonder stag. It's not exactly described how this stag was actually a wonder stag or supernatural being is described as being beautiful and captivating. So they really wanted to hunt the stag down or go where the, the stag was going. And the stag was leading them into these new, new, newer and beautiful territories. And um, this was a beautiful territory of, of meadows and rivers. And there was su such a green, beautiful place. So uh, they took back 100 soldiers with them. And they noticed that during nightfall, 100 girls came out from the bushes, obviously. So the 100 men and, and the 100 girls could marry each other and produce offspring. And these offspring then um, people migrated further um, of these territories. So this is how Indian Hungarians um, settled where they are, why the Huns also went to different territories. <clears throat> and um, so I mentioned Attila the Hun, who was a, a ruler in the fifth century who conquered a large part of the Balkans, Italy, and even part of Greece. And although um, Attila is remembered as, as, the, as the ruler of the Huns, um, Attila is a Hungarian name, and this is still a very popular name. My uncle is called Attila, so I, you know, I have as well some personal connection to, to the name and to this legendary story. Next, I wanted to mention is uh, this mythological bird called the Turo bird. This actually has, the name itself has a Turkish origin. And you can see in the, on the top photo that it looks kind of like an eagle. And according to these legendary stores, legends, uh, the Turo bird was um, leading, uh, again, um, the Hungarians into the territory where they live, where we are, where we settled. Um, and the bird appeared in the dreams and of, of people who were going to the territory, uh, who, were, who were migrating further to Attila's land. And there are some similarities of this bird to other um, shamanic beliefs about these mystical birds. And unfortunately, just 
as well what happened with Nazi Germany, this total ego like bear became a, a, a symbol of the far right and has been highly romanticized as a kind of Hungarian origin myth and and uh, kind of constructing um current national identity. And what you can see as well on the bottom uh, of the page, it's uh, it's a picture uh, from last year. Um, we have a national holiday where we celebrate the foundation of our state. Um, it's actually when our first king was crowned on the 20th of August. And in this uh, parade last year, uh, the government um, created this this um, total bird figure. It's, it's really kitsch and you can see it looks kind of problematic as kind of um, slave-like men are taking him in, taking his bird into this marching parade. So it has some problematic imagery, I think we can all agree. Um, another interesting um, legendary um, tradition here is called Busho Yarash, or you could also translate it as Busho Wandering. So this takes place uh, in one town called Mohaj, which is near the southern borders in Hungary. And this has been also named as part of the UNESCO Entangable Cultural Heritages since 2009. Um, this happens in the carnival season, and this is basically a celebratory march where people um, from the local town dress up in these costumes with scary masks. And there are two um, reasons why this happens, or there are two sources why, why people dress up in this way. One is a kind of more pagan tradition where people scare the winter away. You can see in, on the bottom picture that there is a fire, there's a bonfire, which is meant to be um, burning away of winter and scaring away of winter. I have even seen photos where, where there was a coffin being brought along as a symbolic um, death of winter. And on the on the bottom side in the corner, you can see a painting that's titled uh, "The Battle of Mohaj." So um, this happened in in the in the sixteenth century, and why this event is really important because this was one of the last um, failed battles. But after that, Hungary was overtaken by the Ottoman Empire, and they um, ruled uh, the territory for hundred and fifty years. And when, and when finally Hungary was liberated in the 17th century, according to some of these legendary sources, some of these legends, um, the, the people in Mohaj who were in hiding before uh, were dressing up in these costumes to, to scare the Ottomans away when they finally uh, liberated then Hungary from, um, from, the, from the oppressors. Um, if you didn't know anything about this, you might have come across of the famous uh, Erzsébet Báthory, who was a six, who who is a sixteenth uh, seventeenth century noblewoman. Uh, she was born in Hungary, but because uh, of her marriage into the Báthory family, um, she had ties to Transylvania and Slovakia. And according to what happened um, in in historical sources and legends is that in his in her courtyard there were several mysterious deaths of female servants and then the local palatine, palatine ordered an investigation but as happened at the time with the witch, witch trials as well there was no actual uh, trial happening and some of these um, confessions were made under uh, torture and she was put into prison without any um, official trial and what then became later of the of the legend is that um she she was uh, bathing in the blood of young virgins and then one time when one of her servants was um combing her hair and 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 um then the servant combed her hair too too harshly or something so she got angry and then she slapped the, the girl and it was so harsh that um she drew out blood from the girl's face and then the blood dripped onto her hand and her hands, her skin turned really youthful. Um, so you can see here that there are some similarities to, to Dracula's uh, blood superstitions around blood as a kind of female Hungarian Dracula. But here you can also see some um, sexist element in her, in her story. Um, talking about Dracula, I obviously had to mention um, the historical figure that inspired Dracula. Um, Vlad the Impaler, who um, was a 15th century lord in uh, the territory of Wallachia, which was uh, part of Romania. Um, and uh, there are several reasons why he was the source for 
Dracula's figure. Firstly, um, he was legendary for his torturous uh, methods and in his name as well, it's commemorated that the Vlad the Impaler. He was also the son of Vlad Dracul, who was the member of the Order of the Dragons. Um, so there are some uh, similarities to the name. But Bram Stoker actually um, got in inspired by reading Emily Gerald's book on Transylvania, The Land Beyond the Forest. And originally he wanted to name his Dracula figure Count Vampire, but then he came across also William Wilkinson's um, account, an account of the principalities of Wallachia and Moldavia. And on the on the bottom of the screen, you can see a screenshot from this, um, where Wilkinson notes that Dracula in Wallachian language means devil. So this is the reason why then Stoker changed um, his figure's name into, into Dracula to emphasize his diabolic nature. But apart from this, um, the book Dracula portrays an eclectic vision of folk magic, theology, but also a strong Western imperialist view of Eastern Europe. And if we are talking about is a uh, Western imperialist view of Eastern Europe, um, there's probably no other person who better demonstrates this than Elon Musk, who, um, according to sources last year, he rented out um the Dracula Castle in Romania to to um to organize a Halloween party. And um, I remember reading at a time that among the invited people, there, there was also Justin Bieber um, and some other celebrities. Um, something I wanted to also show you, um, this is a castle in Budapest. I took these photos uh, two years ago, summer time, uh, when I was walking around uh, there with my mom. And in I noticed that in one of the busts um, in this castle grand, um, there is a commemoration of Bela Lugosi, the Hungarian actor who played um, Dracula. Um, so this is an interesting note. If you ever come to, to Budapest, visit the castle and um, not just for the bust, but it's it's a you can see it's it's quite beautiful. Um, of course, I had to mention as well, um, Rasputin, who was um. Well, an interesting figure of a healer, mystic political influencer at the time in the late uh, 19th century, early uh, 20th century Russia, and his birth anniversary was actually yesterday. Um, he was born in Siberia as a peasant, and throughout his life he gained really uh, quite a lot of um, religious and um, political power. So what happened in Russia at the time is that um, most of the people were really poor, and uh, the Orthodox Church was, um, on the other hand, displaying this wealth, uh, wealthy, wealth of them with with beautiful churches, and so people started to get really disillusioned by by the church, by the Orthodox Church. So they turned towards alternative um, sources of religion, such as mysticism and spiritualism. And Rasputin was a kind of leading uh, figure in this. Uh, what he's most known for is that his prayers healed um, Alexei Nikolaevich, the Romanov boy who was suffering from internal ha uh, hemorrhage. Um, and because he, because of his successful healing of, of Alexei, um, he was being kept uh, in the Romanov circles and uh, he was also known for his um, great sexual appetite and, and the parties he was throwing and also his manipulation of high society women and, and using them um, through both, both um, sex and also uh, by being this religious leader for them. Um, he was finally renounced by the Orthodox Church and named it as a heretic in 1907. However, he's, he was still became, he still was an important political influencer for Nikolai Alexandrovich Romanov, and but after the disaster of World War One, which was really quite a lot in um, Russia, which in the end resulted in uh, the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, his political power started to decline. There was a lot of there were a lot of people um, in this aristocratic circle who who did not like Rasputin and wanted to get rid of him. Um, he was stabbed. He was physically assaulted. He was shot various times, and then finally died of a gunshot um, in 1916. Uh, by someone called Yusupov, who wrote in his biography in 1928. This devil who was dying of poison, who had a bullet in his heart, must have been raised from the dead by the powers of evil. There was something appealing and monstrous in his diabolical refusal to die. Um, so you can see that 
Raspolinus as a kind of diabolical figure and somebody who who conquers death uh, comes from um, Yusuf's uh, own biography. But uh, from historical sources discredited already that he was poisoned. So this is something that um, was going around at the time, but today it has been uh, discredited by um, by historians. But it's true that Rasputin remains this legendary figure who, who gained um, religious political power and was um, people people just couldn't kill him. Uh, the next section I'm going to introduce you is folk theories, and here I'm going to have a particular focus on, on transformations. So uh, the first story that we're actually going to watch a video of is called The Prince Who Turned Into Stone. This is part of, um, of an animated series called um, Hungry on Folk Tales, which ran from the 80s until 2012. And these included short stories between six to seven minutes. I also grew up watching these in the telly. Um, what's, what I really like in them and why they're really iconic is that they're defined by a kind of timelessness and uh, they often reflect historical events and the animation style if, uh, um, is also really particularly emphasizes the, um, the geographical location, the folk dresses, traditions and customs, food, um, language features as well, which you won't hear here. And you will also hear at the start of uh, this video, um, a song that's introduced is the tale and ends with the tale. And I also wanted to mention that this has been such an iconic um, music in Hungary that in the early 2000s, when uh, this was before the, the time of the smartphones, um, probably 80% uh, of the population had this as a ringtone for their phone. So um, I don't know what was going in the air. I just wanted to mention as an interesting note that uh, from young to old people, uh, this has been a beloved uh, TV series by, by everyone. So I will start the, the video now if you stop the recording. You're muted. I'm really sorry. <laughs> So the, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, a couple of more information on these um, <clears throat> stories, tales. Um, I choose here one that had an English narrator, but usually uh, the Hungarian narrator of these has um, a deliberate, strong folk or rural um, accent. And uh, the supernatural figures that you, was, that you would see in these stories include the devil himself, uh, different kind of witches you can hear seeing this one as well that it's she's not explicitly called a witch it's more just an old woman who lives in the um, in the forest that I will talk about later uh, there are dragons uh, we often see these celestial bodies are uh, personified um, there are transformations of virgins into birds we see the we have golden apples golden trees <clears throat> all kinds of supernatural things happening in these stories usually um as in as in folk there's the young uh, it's it's around a uh, youngest son or the daughter who goes on a quest and um it's often around as in this story as well they uh, the, <clears throat> the protagonist is um is really cunning and they're outsmarting the evil one <clears throat> and they often portray rural folk life but also uh parts of kings and 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 uh, and royals who who go on an adventure, and they often end uh, usually end with a happy ending. Uh, that's mostly marriage or birth of a child, and the evil is is explicitly punished. Uh, the next story I wanted to tell you is my absolute um, favorite story called "The Word Beautiful Reed Girl." Um, there's no official translation of it, so this is my translation. Um, the story goes that a king had um, two sons and the younger son wanted to find the most beautiful girl in the world. And his nanny advised him that he needs to go to, in the 77th islands of the Black Sea where a witch guards uh, three reeds and uh, a princess is trapped in a reed with two of her maids as well. Um, so um, he was given a horse that sucked dragon milk, ate amber and drank burning flames. These kind of uh, supernatural horses are also often part of the stories. Uh, he also had to slay a dragon and his helper were the personified sun and aurora. 
uh, who guided him into the 77th island of the Black Sea. Um, when he got to the island, um, he he got the reeds, uh, he cut open the first reed uh, where one of the maids was um, inside the reed, but the maid started to to cry for water and the, the boy couldn't give her water, so um, she died immediately. So he made a, a promise to himself not to do the same the two other reeds, but he was too eager and too curious. Um, so unfortunately, he also cut open the second reed. The girl uh, cried out <clears throat> for water, or she said she's going to die, and she dies as well because, again, the prince can't give uh, her water. So um, the prince is now really angry at himself. He's really serious that he's not going to cut open the third reed until he gets to fresh water. So he, he flies in this with the horse, finally gets to near near a pond and near the pond he cuts open the reed that in, that has inside the princess and he's able to give her water so she doesn't die and they marry happy ever, ever after <clears throat> um another transformation story from romania uh the, the tale called the girl who pretended to be a boy uh this story also has greek and armenian variants <clears throat> the story is about um uh, a king who has three daughters and there's an emperor in this bigger territory who demands service from the sons of the king. But because the king only has daughters, uh, he's unsure what to do. So he tries to to um, have the girls go in this quest. And finally, obviously, the youngest girl is the bravest one who is able to go on this quest. And she also gets a horse that has uh fl flame flamey eyes and has coat of shining silver so again you see these similarities between the romanian and the hungarian one about the horse having supernatural powers and the emperor sets her challenges he transforms into a wolf and the girl has to has to slay him slay him and or notice him and and uh, she she overcomes the wolf uh the wolf transformed emperor so the emperor finally realizes, okay, she's brave enough. She can go. She can go on the adventure. In this story, uh, her helper is the personified uh, sunlight, and her her quest is to to rescue the the golden haired Elaine. And um, so I'm actually going to use the now the 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 pronoun they for this uh, for the protagonist, because um, throughout the story, while going on this adventure, uh, the girl. Who pretends to be a boy become becomes perceived as uh, being perceived as as a boy, so um, and their name becomes Fat Frinners, which actually comes from the Romanian Fat Frumos, which just means handsome boy. It's like Prince Charming is the name for you know Prince Charming, and the quest that the emperor gives them is to bring holy water from the river Jordan, and um, and so when when they come back, everyone looks at. Uh, them as as a as a young boy as a young man, and uh, they get married with uh, with Elaine, uh, but Elaine is not happy with the emperor how the emperor sets this quest for for uh, fat runners, so she wants to take revenge on the emperor, and uses this horse who who is able to who 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 is able to fire um uh, breathe fire to to kill him and basically burn him alive. And that's the happy ending of this uh, story. Uh, a Polish story called The Crow. Uh, it's again about um, the youngest princess of the of the king who finds a crow in the nearby castle's ground who turns out to be an enchanted prince. And the crow prince says to the princess that um, she can help him to transform back into, into human if she goes and lives in this ruined castle where uh, she has to sleep in the golden bed and there are all sorts of odd things happen at night ghosts come alive and um, and she has to bear these challenges and um, she has to do this for seven years because there's a seven years curse on on the crow prince and the, the crow prince also tells her that she needs to go into servitude and become a maid and not you know a princess and finally where, where she does that so she demonstrates that she is really dutiful uh, the prince is able to then transform into into human and uh, and then they marry and uh, live in, and move into that castle which probably not a ruined anymore. 
Um, so the next section is uh, on supernatural figures. You could, you saw some of them mentions there, but um, I wanted to talk here about specific um, figures. One is uh, the Vodalak or Vodalak, the different spellings of, of uh, this figure that is a specific type of Slavic or Russian type of vampire. So um, initially there was a difference between um, the vampire and the Vodalak and um, the Vodalak is a more ghoulish type of vampire and what's really specific about him is that uh, he kills family members. He was popularized in Toy Story's novel, The Family of the Vodalak, uh, which you can see on the photo, it's, it's an Argentinian uh, film adaptation of Toy Story's uh, story. And um, and it's also mentioned the the woodluck figure is also mentioned in Eric Stanberg's the true story of the vampire where the Hungarian uh, vampire Count Vardalek uh, kills um, the family of the narrator narrator Carmela. Um, Krampus is a Central European or Eastern European figure that's associated with Saint Nicholas Day. So um, the name of the Krampus comes from uh, has German origin. It comes from Klo. And the Krampus is supposed to come out on the night of the 5th of December, turning into 6th, which is actually uh, Santa Claus uh, Day or, or St. Nicholas Day. And you can see on the bottom picture that he looks like a kind of devilish, half goatish figure who accompanies um, Santa. And he's supposed to be um, taking away the children or punishing the bad ones who, who, who behave badly. Um, so, and what you can see on, on the top side of the screen, is um, what in Hungarian is called virgaj. You usually get it as part of your Santa package. Um, so it's supposed to be a representation that although you got some chocolates, here is some uh, Twix for you as well. So you can be slapped with that in case you behave badly. And, um, and although these are probably not as popular anymore when I was a child, I think um, people realize that um, it's not good to traumatize children with these kind of stories and, and you know, um, say to them that you will be slapped with this. Um, but but traditionally, you will, you will still find this uh, as part of a Christmas package put in the middle of the of the package. The Baba Yaga figure um, is a Slavic witch figure uh, who, as I mentioned, in connection to the Hungarian fairy tale, um, she's an old woman who lives in the middle of the forest, uh, traditionally in a hut on a hand's feet. And as opposed to the kind of more traditional Western grim tales, which figures, she's more ambiguous. Um, she can be a villain, a helper or a mother figure. She usually gives the protagonist different quests. And um, in the Hungarian folk tales, um, as, as you could hear it in the story, um, where the, the old woman was just named an old woman, not a witch. Uh, she's often referenced as a gypsy woman, an, an old nurse, or the iron-nosed midwife, where the midwife uh, is Baba, so it probably has similarities to the Baba Yaga, and uh, she's supposed to have an iron nose representing her hook nose. And in the eco-gothic reading, she is interpreted as a uh, monstrous representation of Mother Nature. Rusalka, or in plural Rusalki, is a Slavic uh, malicious water nymph. Uh, it was similar, po similarly popularized in the Harry Potter series as the Vela figure. Um, she lives in rivers and lakes, and there are different variants and different stories linked to the, to the Rusalka in uh, Russian, Ukrainian, and Slovenian folklore. Um, she always remains young, and she enchants men and, and uh, kills them. Um, a popular representation can be found in Pushkin's poem, The Water Nymph, and the Czech composer's um, opera, um, Rusalka, which is actually uh, is being played in the Hungarian National Theatre in January. You can see it in the middle picture. And finally, to close my presentation with some Christmas fun, uh, some, some Christmas traditions and customs, so this was one of my friend's uh, tweets. Uh, December in Eastern Europe is the smell of putting cabbage and sauerkraut to cook. And I couldn't agree anymore. I spent my December uh, back at home and everything just has been cabbage filled, which um, traditionally I think the, the meaning of it is that cabbage has a lot of vitamin C. So you're supposed to get your vitamins in the winter as well.
<clears throat> I mentioned Saint Nicholas Day or Santa Claus Day, which is the 6th of December, uh, which is celebrated in, in uh, parts of Germany, Austria, Hungary, uh, parts of Eastern Europe, um, where um, it's basically a pre-Christmas treat for, for the children. It's something that you can... Um, you get chocolates for when you prepare, you put your socks out uh, because um, traditionally uh, for us, it's the baby Jesus that brings the presents on Christmas Eve. So there's a separate Santa Claus, St. Nicholas Day. Um, St. Lucy's Day or, or Lucy's Day, Lutzen up, is celebrated on the 13th of December. So this was uh, this week as well. Um, this is a, a um, an event that has some pagan origin as well, has some um, rituals, folk rituals that are around the protection of the family, uh, guarding away evil evil spirits and witches. You're supposed to put out garlic in the outside of your house as well and protect house animals like chickens. And there is a tradition uh, connected to this day where you, you have a, a part of a, of a wood and each day you, you cut a little bit of that until Christmas when you create, uh, so finally you create this chair, the Lutza chair, Lutza um, Seik, uh, but you step on, on the top of it on the midnight mass and it's supposed to reveal your, reveal to you who is the witch in the, um, in the church and then finally this chair is being burned at midnight. And I was told by my grandmother that um, her stepdad in the post-war times was making this chair every year. So this is something that's still kind of really um, alive in um, in more rural parts of the country. And um, I also got to know that women are not supposed to do any housework on this day. Um, before closing my presentation, I, I wanted to show you a traditional Christmas carol. So I actually did not realize for a very long time that this is not a a Christmas carol known by, known for, by, by everyone. So I wanted to show you this uh, Christmas carol that's titled Small Christmas, Large Christmas. If you could... Um, you know, to this, um, one, thank you. Um, so to finally finish my presentation, um, some traditional Christmas food uh, from around the region. Um, on the top, you can see traditional Hungarian fish soup. Uh, this is something my, that my family often also makes. Um, these are made of um, water uh, lake fishes, uh, fried fish, of course, the cabbage I mentioned, stuffed cabbage, and some uh, dessert cakes. Um, on the bottom of the screen, you can see a roll that's called Bagley. So it has a German, original German name uh, that's traditionally filled with poppy seeds, uh, chestnut, and walnut. Uh, we use a lot of... Um, poppy seeds in our cakes and, and chestnut and nuts around this time. There is a traditional um, linzer that also comes from uh, Austria. And the, in the middle, you can see a half moon shaped uh, cake called Hokifli, which is called snow. Uh, Kifli is the type of bread, actually. And uh, that's also filled with marmalade, um, walnut, poppy seed. And the layered cake is, is the traditional uh, gerbo cake. Um, thank you for your attention and I hope you, you enjoyed the presentation.